This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome to Raising Me. This is where we take parenting questions and challenges straight to the experts for advice with self-reflection really top of mind. I'm Adrienne Stein, a mom of three, a preschooler, middle schooler, and a high schooler, trying to figure it all out just like you. Today, we're diving into parenting styles and discipline. There are so many opinions out there on how, where, why to discipline, and there is a heck of a lot of self-doubt when it comes with this, too. How about, when should I be tough? When do I maybe let something slide for the greater good? What if what we're doing isn't working? And let's just be brutally honest here. What about when we overreact? I feel like a terrible mom when that happens. I know most of us, if not all of us, have been there, too. So what then? What can we do? Therapist Monica Eichler is going to help us walk through all of that and why looking back at how we experience discipline as a child is so important. Plus, the parenting style that can lead to raising the happiest adults. A lot of good takeaways today. Monica, thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. And we're talking about discipline. Um, I, obviously, it's a basic part of parenting, right? But finding the right balance of it can be so tricky and there's so much self-doubt that can, can can go along with it. Let's just start off with why why is discipline important? Discipline is just, it's the overarching uh, context for really in some ways how we relate because even in those good moments, those good moments are coming out of a sense of safety that the child experienced that I know my parents have my back that they will let me know, they will be my guides and let me know what it is that I need to be doing. What, you know, where are my banks? Coming back to your question of why is it important? uh, If we have boundaries that are clear, that are developmentally appropriate for a child, it can be like a well-oiled running machine. The need for discipline actually goes down all the time because there's not only clarity, but there's predictability. So those are some of the pieces when we think about discipline is how appropriate are the expectations for this four-year-old versus this 11-year-old? Are they just too much and the child can't handle it, right? Or uh, are there not in alignment? Like no four-year-olds really need to be able to do X, Y, and Z. A two-year-old, not so much. Yeah, no, that's so, and and obviously it does, depending on the child's age, it looks a lot different. And there are some some major key parenting styles, right? And we're going to dive into those a little bit. But but first, I think it's important to look back because how we were parented or disciplined as children greatly impacts the way we approach parenting and discipline with our own kids. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Mm-hmm. That's such a beautiful and so true uh, of a statement. And oftentimes, I think that in the past, it hasn't necessarily been an area where a lot of parenting books start off with. Like if I were to write a parenting book, it would be kind of assessing what did you experience? You know, how much um, shame, for example, that you experienced. Shame is so toxic and yet it's kind of Per, like it's, I won't say it's per day, so hopefully it's not, but you know, I see it in schools. It's, it's, and we don't even realize that shame is not necessarily happening, but, um, beginning to be, uh, self reflective on, you know, what is it about, you know, when I think about how I was raised, what felt really safe? Um, what felt, um, you know, maybe a little bit, uh, uncomfortable in the moment, but looking back, I'm really glad 
that 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 my parents said no to those things. It meant that they cared. And so it's a little bit of, you know, all of our biographies, uh, certainly with, with how we were parented, you know, where we went to school, but particularly how we were parenting uh, colors, how then we approach our own children. And it, it, it's really impossible right, to not have that come in as an influence. And how can we use, you know, potentially negative experiences from our own past to improve how we're parenting our own children? That process of becoming very conscious of what is it a, what is it that I that didn't work for me? And sometimes that can be done with a therapist. Sometimes it can be done through journaling. Um, sometimes it can be done with a friend. Like there's lots of different ways that we can go through some different exercises and explore that. Certainly if there was trauma, that may be a little bit more difficult to just sort of kind of overcome on our own. We might need some additional support around that. But just being aware, you know, that statement that you make that it's impossible for how we were parented to not show up in how we parent at present time. And so just knowing that, being cognizant of that, is always, I, I think it's going to start us hopefully thinking about how we might want to experience. And you know, what's, what's interesting, I think about what you say is you, you've probably heard people say, um, you see it in movies all the time, like I've become my mother, you know, in a way, like I didn't want to become my mother, but I become my mother, I become my father, what have you. And that's a little bit of that unconscious, right? Imprinting that we experience. And all of a sudden we realize, wow. I'm doing it as well. And there's, you know, there's no like necessarily one route um, for any human being to say, okay, if you do this, you're going to be a really conscious parent. But, but we have some ideas um, around some things we can do. Um, Certainly uh, listening to parenting podcasts, for example, is a great start. Um, Certainly some parenting books. I would say if you're on planet earth, uh, you're going to be experiencing sort of messiness, right? Uh, within your own emotional life. No one, um, no one really gets like a break, um, necessarily of never experiencing discomfort. And if you're a parent, it's sort of the same thing. You are going to be going to force you or to look at what happened with you. Our children are our greatest mirrors. And they're going to mirror back to us what's working and what's not working. And then at that point, we have a decision to make of saying, looking at this and saying, oh, let me pay attention to this. Right? Mm-hmm. And is it something about me, something about my child, something about the situation? And that's an excellent point. There, there are some, some key styles of parenting. So mm-hmm. Let, let's talk about those specific styles mm-hmm. and then the characteristics of each. Yeah, there's, there's probably been more than these four identified, but these are um, sort of the, you know, when we begin to sort of filter them all down, they, these are the four um, major ones. So the first one is an authoritarian style. Um, and it, it, the focus is a lot on obedience, you know, compliance, um, and punishment as a form of discipline. Um, then we have authoritative. Um, so sometimes those two, um, get a little bit, um, confused. But that one, that style of parenting is really trying to create a positive, relationship. Um, it absolutely is still enforcing the rules, but the focus is on the relationship itself. Then we have, so this is kind of on a continuum. We're moving along the continuum and we have more of a permissive, passive parenting where there's not a lot of enforcement of rules. Um, you know, sort of that uh, maybe gesture of, oh, kids will be kids. Of course, they're going to, you know, do X, Y, and C. Um, and, you know, we, we can imagine that that's not uh, very healthy. 
And then we have um, the fourth, which is often not talked about, but it would be the uninvolved parent. Again, there, there's very little guidance. There's that word guidance again. Um, and there's also even very little engagement, very little nurturing. And so there's sort of a, um, a removal of, of attention. And, um, so it's sort of the, the typical gesture of more or less the parent either looking at their phone or looking at a TV at a screen. And, you know, the child is wanting to engage with them, but, you know, they just, they can't. For a variety of reasons. When you look at those four different styles, is there a particular parenting style mm-hmm. that results in healthier, mm-hmm. happier mm-hmm. adults? Absolutely. In fact, the American um, Academy of Pediatrics recommends more of the authoritative approach. You know, the one where. Um, children are experiencing warmth and they know their parents love them really deeply where there's a lot of focus and a lot of effort in really creating and maintaining this positive relationship with your child. Um, There's also often uh, a deeper explanation of what the rules, so those expectations, the clarity is there and with that comes predictability, the child knows oh, when I do this, this happens and it's consistent. It's not a, well, I've done it. You know, I could do it a hundred times and only the 101th time will my parent do something. It's really confusing to the the child's brain. Um, So that consistency is in place. Um, And so there's the setting of limits. There's the enforcement of the rules. There are consequences. But all of this is done in with taking the child's um, own feelings into consideration. And this piece is really important as we, I I do a lot of work um, around having parents observe what is happening to the the child's own nervous system, right? Because I used to say, and I, and and I taught three to six-year-olds and I used to always say, you know, within my class, I could have the Miss Monica very firm tone of voice with one child. And if I ever had that same voice with another child, they would collapse. It would just be so hard on them. And and there's, there's no way that I could have, uh, I, I could have done that or should have done that for that particular child. A, they didn't need it, right? They, they saw the rule, they knew the rules but another child did need. And so that can be tricky, Adrian. I don't know if you have more than one child, but then you're becoming like a, a different parent, you know, like three different mothers, right? Because your children's ability to um, uh, take in these uh, different ways, not only the content of the rules, but also the tone in which it's delivered. I, I have three kids, okay. age four, 10, almost 11, and 15. So I relate mm-hmm. to that different, mm-hmm. mo- just age-wise, mm-hmm. not to mention right. the personality-wise. So it is a, it's a delicate dance. And there have been many times where I'm like, I feel like I handled that very poorly. And mm-hmm. now what? Right. There's probably a question in that. You know, what, what about mm-hmm. when you feel like you've made a mistake in whatever a a particular situation is when it comes to discipline or how do you know what is just enough or too much or not enough? This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. I love that you're really asking this question because you're, it's already telling me that there's maybe even a, a consciousness of being attuned to your child, like that you notice. Like, oh, that I, I may have 
I may have gone overboard with either the actual consequence or maybe how loud my voice was. Um, and I can sense that this didn't go down well. Um, and if you're a parent, I'm just going to say it's going to happen, right? Um, and if you're a parent, what's also beautiful is that your children will give you another opportunity either in the next hour or the next 24 hours generally um, to, to redo that. So, you know, how can I, how can we do this differently? So again, depending on the age of the child, I would say probably maybe starting at four, it kind of depends on the four-year-old. Um, once uh, everyone is maybe more on the calm side, of course, and our prefrontal cortex is working again, um, I would offer to say to your child, you know, that thing that happened earlier when you said this and then I said that and then we ended up seeing these things, you know, I, I wonder how that was for you because for me, so you're modeling your own uh, experience and not too much, right? We're not wanting them to be responsible for our feelings, but we can say for me that it didn't feel good and I wonder if we can do that differently next time. So there's, you know, you're not telling them, hey, the rules are not going to be in place. But what you're messaging to them is you matter. And I noticed that this was uh, really hard for you. And I want to, and, and sometimes hard is okay, but I just want to let you know that I care about that. And you may still not go to the party because you lied to me about it. Um, and uh, I want to know, I, I want you to know that I, that perhaps we can have a different kind of, kind of conversation around how this might happen in the future. It, well, as we're thinking mm -hmm. about all, you know, how we're approaching this and what w works, what may not work, um, when we identify that maybe a different strategy for a, a child is needed, it, it can be tricky. It doesn't, it's not like you try something new and right. bam, it starts working. Right. There's some patience sometimes when you try to take a different approach, when you can tell something just is not, you're not getting through to your, your kid. Right. Absolutely. Patience, certainly with yourself and patience with your child. You know, really looking at the environment, the environment has so much in terms of shaping our children's behavior. Often, I think a little bit more than what we might think it's more personality based. My child's not listening to me. Well, if there's a lot of high pre preference activities that are going on in their environment, like screen times or, you know, other people that they're engaged with, yes, that's going to, for you to uh, expect that they will hear something that's happening, or you know, 20 feet away, that's challenging or, or setting up a situation where it's going to be really challenging for them to really hear you. So in a situation like that, you know, uh, finding proximity, you know, seeing if they'd be willing to make eye contact with you. You're not always, sometimes eye contact is too much for a child, uh, holding their hand. But the most important thing, Adrienne, and this is something that sometimes parenting books leave out, is what are you doing in terms of your own self-regulation? Because if we're expecting our children to be in that place of being able to listen to us. There are things that have to first be in place. Number one, they can't have their own level of like upset or ready about something. Like maybe if they're processing something from school, right? And they're not telling us and we don't know, but there's sort of an inner at level of agitation. Their ability to then be able to do this and this and this when they come home from school, put away your lunchbox. Okay, put your shit. It's just too much. Their prefrontal cortex, you know, is sort of diminished in that moment. And when you're noticing your own emotions begin to rise, it's really impossible for them to, to be in that really calm place. So putting, you know, what does it mean? What does it look like for you to put on your oxygen mask? It, for some parents I've worked with, it means, you know what? I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. And for them, that's symbolic of I'm tending to my needs right now. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk to them about what just happened. 
but I am first going to find that inner calm within me and whatever that looks like, right? Um, cause it's going to be different for, for everyone. But that is a, a, like, no matter what strategy you're using, if you have that inner sense of like, okay, I got this. I'm going to be firm. I'm going to be, but gentle. I'm going to be coming from a loving place. Um, children will experience that. And there are something called mirror neurons and they're mirror, it, it's, um, mirror neurons that, you know, people are like, well, what's that? You know, when you yawn and then all of a sudden other people in the room are yawning, those are mirror neurons. And it has to do with a lot of times how, um, there are certain messages before we were pre-verbal, um, in evolutionary periods how we sensed what was going on in the, you know, in the group that we were in. Um, and so children are always sort of reading us, you know, reading our emotions, even non-verbally. And if we're not in an okay place, they're going to be a little bit anxious. And in that moment to expect them to, again, do X, Y, and Z, we're having two incompatible behaviors in their brain, right? So. Um, when something is not working, we want to ask ourselves, what am, what's going on with me? Um, and then what's going on with my child that isn't enabling them, um, to really be able to listen both internally and externally. Yes. Th those are, that's great point. And I think, you know, ultimately we have to be the adults in the room. It is easier said than done sometimes in the heat of the moment, but finding that sort of way to take the deep breath, whether it's that right. cup of tea or just stepping outside in the uh, sunshine for a minute or, you know, walk in the block. Um, yeah. Oh, it could be, I was going to say, it could be also something that you do prior to uh, being in the room with your child, right? Or picking them up from school. Um, so how do you resource yourself is the phrase that I use. If you're coming to your children pretty depleted and then they are showing up with needs because children have needs and you're already depleted, that's that's where things begin to go awry. And it puts everybody on edge. Absolutely. Right. And, and that's I think a takeaway here is that that's normal. Like you, you're in good company. If, if you feel like that, we all do. It's, you know, the, the point today mm -hmm. is, is sort of identifying those things and figuring out how to get our, get around it. If there, there, there mm -hmm. was one key takeaway mm -hmm. for you, Monica, today for, for our audience, what would that be? The kind of overarching skill that we develop within ourselves as parent to be reflective and to review not only in the moment what happened, but kind of doing a nightly review within ourselves. Like how did, you know, what happened there at, at kind of four o'clock? They had just had snack. They weren't quite doing homework. And all of a sudden two of my kids went, yeah, yeah. And I said something because I thought it was really one. And, and just having a little bit of assessment of, hmm, and maybe not even talking to them. But what is it about that experience um, that I might want to shift? Um, tomorrow. And it may work and it may not. But just mm -hmm. the act of doing it, uh, first of all, will also model to children uh, problem solving. Because the next day, you might uh, even say something, you know, I noticed yesterday that this over here wasn't working as well. And let's just be curious. Let's just because scientists, right, are curious. They want to know, like, what's going to happen if we do this and this? And so let's be curious, what happens if the two of you sit here? Is it going to be easier or harder? Can we just try it? And all of that is coming out of your own inner questioning of, hmm, how can I do this differently in a way that, again, if we go back to the authoritary, authoritative style um, of parenting, how can I do this differently in a way that continues to foster connection? Right, that attachment, that nurturing, that is what really children need the most. And I do like that, you know, you brought a point up that we can reset. If we have said something or we raised our voice uh, when yep. maybe 
we didn't need to, but we were feeling depleted that we can go, it's okay to go to the child and say, you know what, I wish I had handled that differently. And, and not only is it okay, but we want our children to see that we're human and we want them even, um, I think even more importantly to see our striving to be sort of, you know, better, whatever that means, you know, the next time or the next day, because they are also going to model that striving within themselves. And they're not going to be then, um, perhaps they will also be a little bit more um, gentle and compassionate with themselves when maybe they might say something to someone and they might then have an easier time of saying, oh, well, you know, I was thinking about what you said to me yesterday and then I said that and, you know, that didn't feel good, right? They're, they're going to be doing the same thing that you did with them. And I think most parents would want their children to also have those not only self-reflective skills, but also the skills then to be able to go back and say, oops, I messed up. I messed up. Redo. Yeah, that's life. Welcome to life for sure. Exactly. Monica, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your insight. We will have more on this on WGME.com slash raising me. In the meantime, have a great day. One of the things that stuck with me is that looking back is so key to working toward doing our best moving forward. For example, what did discipline look like for you growing up? Really think about it. Was shame part of it? How did that feel? As Monica explained, that is so toxic. So how can we do better? Just as importantly, what were the good things from your past that you can tap into to create a healthy situation for the kids? And this is probably what I'm keeping top of mind. It's okay when we mess up. Not only is it okay, it's healthy to reset and take responsibility with a, hey, I did not handle that well. Here's what I was trying to say. And I hope we can do things differently next time. And of course, ask yourself today, what does it look like to put on my own oxygen mask and do that? Thank you so much for being a part of Raising Me. I'm Adrienne Stein. This episode is edited by Megan Littlefield. Please take a moment to follow Raising Me wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, we really appreciate a positive rating and review as well so that others can find today's message. Until next time, I hope you learned something new and get to take a little time for you.